and has been bleak for years. The main reason is that first class mail volume has declined dramatically with the advent of the internet. Because the postal system is constrained by a host of legislative requirements, it does not have the flexibility a private sector entity would have to deal with the dramatic reduction in the demand for its products. Now, in a perfect world, the postal system would have funded its long-term pension and retiree health care liabilities as they were incurred. Because they didn't, those unfunded liabilities now total $120 billion. Unfortunately, the 2006 Postal Reform Bill did not ensure long-term financial viability. And in its attempt to address the unfunded liability problem, it depleted the postal system of cash and arbitrarily turned long-term liabilities into short-term liabilities on its balance sheet. Subsequent attempts at reform have largely proposed a taxpayer bailout. The cost of these proposals is generally understated based on CBO's 10-year scoring requirement, which misleadingly characterizes a $48.8 billion bailout as only costing $10.7 billion over 10 years. These proposals also lack the full range of structural reforms that will be required to ensure the long-term viability of the system. For years, GAO and Inspector General's reports have recommended reform that at best have only been partially implemented. One of the most costly inefficiencies that have been repeatedly highlighted in these reports is the out of control use and payment of overtime. To its credit, this is the reform Post Postmaster DeJoy began implementing shortly after his appointment. According to an Inspector General report issued the day Postmaster DeJoy was sworn in, the post office spent $4 billion in fiscal year 2019 in mail processing and delivery overtime and penalty overtime costs. Those overtime costs represent 45% of the postal system's $8.8 billion loss for, that, for last year. Is Postmaster DeJoy's commendable attempt to reduce those excess costs that are now being cynically used to create this false political narrative? According to Democrats, the postmaster is trying to sabotage the postal system to disenfranchise voters in the upcoming election. Notices that were sent before he was sworn in meant to inform election officials to factor in normal postal capabilities in setting their ballot deadlines are being used as evidence of this conspiracy theory. And a willing media is once again happily playing along. On average, the postal system delivered 2.6 billion pieces of non-packaged mail per week in 2019. Because of COVID, the postal system's first class weekly volume is down 17% this year to date. Even if every voter used mail-in balloting, that would be approximately 150 million pieces of mail or less than 6% of weekly volume. As long as election officials factor in normal postal delivery capabilities and in light of the 17% decline in weekly volume, the postal system has more than enough excess capacity to handle mail-in balloting. So again, I want to thank Postmaster General DeJoy for his appearance today, for his service, and I look forward to your testimony. Senator Peters. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, Mr. DeJoy, I certainly appreciate uh, you joining us here today. And as you can imagine, uh, we have uh, a lot of questions uh, for you. We are in the middle of an uh, unprecedented pandemic. We're experiencing one of the nation's worst health and economic crises. And now we're facing a mail crisis and we're just months away from an election where we expect record numbers of Americans to, to vote by mail. For many communities uh, in Michigan and across the country, the Postal Service has always been a lifeline, especially for the communities where private carriers simply don't deliver. Whether folks are receiving important medications, financial documents, <laughs> critical home supplies, or simply trying to stay in touch with their loved ones, the Postal Service has always delivered. But Mr. DeJoy, I don't think you have. You have not delivered in this brief tenure so far. For more than two centuries, Americans have been able to count on the Postal Service. But in less than two months as Postmaster General, you have undermined one of our nation's most trusted institutions and we wreaked havoc on families, on veterans, seniors, rural communities, and on people all across our country. The operational changes you implemented without consulting with your customers or the public uh, have caused significant delays. Delays that have hurt people across the nation. Delays that come at a time when people depend on reliable service now more than ever. 
In July, I started hearing reports about how severely your changes were slowing down the mail. I asked you for answers, but it wasn't until I launched an investigation that you admitted that you had directed these changes yourself. And despite multiple requests, it took more than one month to respond directly. And I'm still not satisfied with those explanations. You have brushed off these delays, calling them inevitable, a side effect of your vision for the Postal Service. But let me tell you about the people who are forced to bear the brunt of your decisions. Beth from Ada, Michigan, works for a company that produces educational materials for healthcare workers. Beth's company started ser seeing serious uh, delivery problems and switched to overnight shipping, which has almost doubled their shipping cost. And between these delays and the pandemic, they have had to lay off multiple employees to help absorb these costs. Mary from Redford said her daughter has been getting her epilepsy medication through the mail, usually in three to four days. But because of changes you ordered, her latest refill shipped on July 20th, and it took nine days, nine days to be delivered. When Mary's daughter realized the medication wasn't going to arrive on time, she tried to ration what, what few pills that she had left. And as a result, she suffered seizures and was transported to a hospital. These are just a few of my constituents who have shared their stories as part of my investigation. I have received more than 7,500 reports of delays from people across Michigan and across the country in just two weeks. They have written to me about skipping doses of their medication and their small businesses losing customers or having to lay off employees, all because of changes that you directed. Mr. Chairman, I move to enter into the hearing record an update on what my investigation is finding. Without objection. Mr. DeJoy, your decisions uh, have cost Americans their health, their time, their livelihoods, and their peace of mind. I believe you owe them an apology for the harm you have caused and you all, all of us, some very clear answers today. The country is anxious about whether the damage you have inflicted so far can be quickly reversed and what other plans you have in store that could further disrupt reliability and timely delivery from the Postal Service. If you plan to continue pursuing these kinds of changes, I think my colleagues and many of our constituents will continue to question whether you are the right person to lead this indispensable institution. Thank you. It is the tradition of this committee to swear in witnesses. So Mr. DeJoy, if you'll raise your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lewis DeJoy has served as the Postmaster General since 2000, June 2020. Prior to his unanimous East selection and appointment by the Bipartisan Postal Service Board of Governors, he spent more than 35 years developing and managing a successful nationwide logistics company as chairman and CEO of New Breed Logistics. Beginning in 2014, uh, Mr. DeJoy served as the CEO of XPO Logistics Supply Chain Business in the Americas. After his retirement in 2015, he joined the, board's, the company's board of directors where he served until 2018. Uh, Mr. DeJoy. Uh, good morning, Chairman, Ranking Member Peters, and members of the committee. Thank you, Chairman Johnson, for calling this hearing. I'm proud to be with you today on behalf of the 630,000 dedicated men, women and men of the United States Postal Service. On June 15th, I became America's 75th Postmaster General. I did so because I believe the Postal Service plays a tremendously positive role in the lives of the American public and the life of the nation. I also welcome the opportunity to lead this organization because I believe there is an opportunity for the Postal Service to better serve the American public and also to operate in a financially sustainable manner. Congress established the Postal Service to fulfill a public service mission to provide prompt, reliable, and universal postal services to the American public in an efficient and financially sustainable fashion. Our ability to fulfill that mandate in the coming years is at fundamental risk. Changes must be made to ensure our sustainability for the years and decades ahead. 
Our business model established by the Congress requires us to pay our bills through our own efforts. I view it as my personal obligation to put the organization in a position to fulfill that mandate. With action from the Congress and our regulator and significant effort by the Postal Service, we can achieve this goal. This year, the Postal Service will likely report a loss of more than $9 billion. Without change, our losses will only increase in the years to come. It is vital that Congress enact reform legislation that addresses our unaffordable retirement payments. Most importantly, Congress must allow the Postal Service to integrate our retiree health benefits program with Medicare, which is a common sense practice followed by all businesses that still offer retiree health care. It also must rationalize our, function pay, our, our pension funding payments. Legislative actions have been discussed and debated for years, but no action has been taken. I urge the Congress to expeditiously enact these reforms. I also urge the Congress to enact legislation that would provide the Postal Service with financial relief to account for the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on our financial condition. The Postal Regulatory Commission began a mandated review of our pricing system four years ago. It has been three years since the con Commission concluded that our current system is not working. We urgently require the PRC to do its job and establish a more rational regulatory system for our mail products. Had the Congress and PRC fulfilled their obligations to the American public concerning the Postal Service, I am certain that much of our $80 billion in cumulative losses since 2007 could have been avoided and that our operational and financial performance would not now be in such jeopardy. The Postal Service must also do its part. We must adapt to the realities of our marketplace, generate more revenue and control our costs. I believe we can chart a path for our business to, that accomplishes these goals. In my 67 days as Postmaster General, I have also had the chance to observe the many hidden strengths of the organization and appreciate our critical mission of service to the American public. Despite our deep, long-standing financial problems, there is an incredible strong base to build upon and a tremendous desire of the public for the Postal Service to succeed. As we head into the election season, I want to assure this committee and the American public that the Postal Service is fully capable and committed to delivering the nation's election mail securely and on time. This sacred duty is my number one priority between now and Election Day. Mr. Chairman, women and men of the Postal Service have, been, have demonstrated extraordinary commitment for our mission throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. In every community in America, we continue to work to keep our employees and customers safe as we fulfill our essential role delivering medications, benefit checks, and financial statements the public depends upon. Since the beginning of the pandemic, there has been a public outpouring of support for postal employees as they perform their essential service throughout the nation. This is a well-deserved testament to their dedication. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Peters, I look forward to working with you and this committee and our stakeholders to restore the financial health of the United States Postal Service and to improve the way we serve the American public. This concludes my remarks and I welcome any questions that you and the committee may have. Well, thank you for that opening statement, Mr. Postmaster General. Uh, I just wanna kind of go through and uh, give you a chance to respond to some of these false narratives. First of all, let's talk about that uh, election notice was sent out by, I believe, the uh, Postal Services uh, General Counsel. Uh, one notice before you became Postmaster General, uh, one notice, I think, after you assumed your, your duties. Uh, talk about what that notice was about and, uh, you know, from my standpoint, uh, how, how important it was that uh, the Postal Service does inform election officials of what your basic capabilities are so they can factor that into their deadlines. Yes, sir. Thank you for the for the opportunity to, to speak about this. First, I'd like to emphasize that there has been no changes in any policies with regard to election mail uh, 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 for, the, for the 2020 election. Uh, as, as you stated, uh, the, this letter was sent out before my, arri before my arrival simply to help educate state election boards 
and eventually the American people, uh, there was a plan put together to eventually make this a broader statement so the American people had awareness on uh, how to, uh, you know, how to successfully vote. This letter, pretty very similar letter was sent out in the 2016, 2016 election by the former Deputy Postmaster General. We recognize that during, uh, 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 during this uh, pandemic, when I arrived, there was great concern about the increase in, in, in volume. So we, we further emphasized uh, the, the interaction. We had over 50,000 contacts before my arrival with state election boards uh, uh, to uh, help, help them understand the mail processing uh, uh, procedures uh, of the Postal Service. Since my arrival, we we have I have stat, we've established and extended a task force. We have uh, put up a website or putting up a website within a within within a day, uh, and we are diligently working to, uh, to to ensure the American public and to ensure a, a successful election. Uh, in, in my opening statement, I, I remarked that 150 million pieces of uh, or ballots would represent about six percent of weekly volume. I think in your written testimony, you said in terms of what's actually expected in terms of mail-in ballots, about 2%. Can, can you just talk about and, and assure the American public and this committee that the postal system has more than enough capacity to handle uh, the, the number of ballots? It's, it's really a, a matter of election officials understanding what delivery capabilities are? Yes, sir. We have more. Uh, to, we, we deliver two, 433 million pieces of mail a day. Uh, so 150 million ballots, 160 million ballots over a course of a, a, a week is, uh, 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 you know, a very, very small amount. Adequate capacity. Plus, mail volume is down, uh, as you said, 13, 14 percent th this, this year. Uh, plus, as I identified uh, earlier in the week, we will uh, have additional resources on, on, on sta standby. Should, I mean, if everyone complies with, with the with the uh, with the mail process uh, that we've been identifying, there will be absolutely no issue, and we are we there's there's slack in the system and additional processes that we will deploy in and around the election that will uh, uh, carry a good part of any deviations uh, uh, to you know to get through. We are perfectly the postal service stands ready. Our board of directors uh, stand ready. Uh, we with the, with the expansion of the task force that I that I had identified uh, earlier in the week. Uh, yesterday, we made the decision to establish a board, a bipartisan board commission uh, committee uh, to st to stand over the uh, over the postal to interact with us as we move forward. We are very very comfortable that we will achieve this mission, sir. Something else I think has been blown away out of proportion is is the retirement of some of the blue boxes. Uh, can you speak to the, how that is just a normal procedure that we have literally, because uh, you know, first class mail is down over the decades. Uh, almost the volume's almost been cut in half. I think I don't have the numbers right off the top of my head. But uh, anytime you have a business where your volume is declining that dramatically, you're going to be starting. You'll take out uh, different capacities. So can you address uh, the, the the issue yeah. of the the normal retirement of what the history of that has been of, of not only the blue boxes but also some of your sorting machines yes sir thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, about that over the there's today there's about 140,000 collection boxes out out in the uh, uh in, in the united states over the last 10 years about 30 it averages about 3,500 years so 35,000 of them have been removed and it's a it's a data-driven uh, method. I, have, I haven't reviewed it, but every year they look at utilization of, 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 of post boxes. They look at where they place new post boxes. They look at where communities grow. Uh, so 35,000 over 10 years. Uh, it, since my arrival, we removed 700, uh, uh, 700 post uh, po collection boxes, of which I had no idea uh, uh, that that was a process or I've been, uh, that that was a process. When, we found out when I found out about it. We we socialized it here amongst the leadership team and looked at what the what you know what the um, um, what the excitement was it was creating. So I decided uh, to uh, to stop it, uh, and we'll pick it up after the election. But this is a normal process that's been around for, uh, 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 for since you know it's been around 50 years. And over the last 10 years, we got we have. Uh, uh, 
we have, we have pulled back about 35,000. On the machines, the machines we are speaking about, again, mail volume is, is dropping. This is a process that uh, I, I was unaware about. It's been around for a couple of years now. We evaluate uh, uh, our uh, uh, machine capacity. These machines run about 35% utilization. Uh, the mail volume is uh, it is uh, you know dropping uh, uh, very rapidly, and especially during during the COVID crisis. And package volume is growing, and we need. And uh, when I when I spoke with the team uh, when this too became uh, uh, got a lot of air airplay, uh, uh, we really are moving these machines out to make room to process packages. Uh, no, uh, we still have we have hundreds of these machines everywhere. Uh, and uh, still not any kind of drain on uh, capacity. And I repeat, both the collection boxes and this machine uh, uh, the close down, I, had, I, was, I was made aware when everybody else was made aware. It was not a critical issue uh, 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 you know, within, the, within the Postal Service. This has been going on in every election year and every year for, for that matter. So, so this isn't some devious plot on your part. One final question here. I'm just going to go a little over time. But I think it's important that you describe the change, the operational changes you were making to, to try and start curbing in some of these excess costs, you know, $4 billion of overtime and overtime penalties about uh, making sure that uh, the system adheres to its time deadlines and, and what effect that has on, on mail delivery. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, when, when I arrived, uh, when, I, when I was uh, awarded the, uh, the, the position, I spent the first three weeks, even before I, I joined here, really studying the, the organization, uh, trying to get an understanding of, you know, what, uh, what was driving, you know, how decisions were made and what, 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 what the network looked like and how the mail moved through the uh, uh, process. I spent, I, I spent hundreds and hundreds of hours before I arrived and then, when I got here, working with the management uh, 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 team. And one of the first things, the first big change I embarked upon is uh, how do I get the organization, the management team, the structure to align with what we, that my, in, in, in my analysis, uh, I, I, I felt there were, that we had 600,000 people reporting to one person and uh, uh, other executives doing accessorial types of, uh, important, but not integrated into the operational activity. So I worked with the management team, both collectively and individually, to to, to look at our uh, look at our uh, you know our, our functional lines, and we together re reorganized uh, the the organization to to move forward on on uh, process improvements, improving service, and, and and garnering new business, new revenue, and costs. So that was the one big change I worked on. When, 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 when I got here. The other change, when I was, the day I was sworn in, I received a report from the, from the OIG uh, that spoke about the things that you were talking about, late, late deliveries, uh, late, late dispatch, extra trips, and all the time and costs associated around, around this that approximated $4 billion. We were facing, this was before we had the note, we were facing, I had $13 billion in cash and twelve and a half billion dollars of payments to make in the next nine months, uh, and a, 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 a no no help in sight. We didn't have a we had we had no help in sight. Uh, so I needed to look at a, a a positive impact on cost savings that did not uh, 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 that that improved the improved the business. The transportation schedule. I'll tell you, we run about 40,000 trips a day, and twelve percent of those trips were late. And we were, a, we were running another 5,000 trips a day in, 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 extra, in extra trips. FedEx, UPS, everybody runs their trucks on time, right? That's what glues the whole network together, our collection process to our delivery process. If that is not running schedule, and that was not my Lewis DeJoy schedule, that was the Postal Service's schedule that was connected to all the delivery points, the 161 million delivery points that we deliver to each day, that had to be on time to, to get our carriers out on time, to make the deliveries on time so they can get back during the day instead of the night. And that was the number one, the transportation network was the glue that keeps everything together. And I worked with the team for, uh, we had you know many, many people involved, operating people involved with the team. We had all the area vice presidents involved with this, with this, with this change. And we have taken, I submitted in my, uh, uh, my report, uh, this, this, this chart here, 
which shows that we went from 88%, 88% on time to 97% on time delivery. All that mail that was sitting on docks got advanced. And our late trips dropped from 5,000, from 20, 3,500 a day to 600 a day. Within a week, we made, we made that change. Unfortunately, uh, some uh, there, some mail did not some mail our process our production processing within the plants was not fully aligned with this established schedule. So you know uh, uh, this so we we had some delays in, in the mail and our recovery process in this should have been a few days and it's amounted to be a few weeks. Uh, so but the change that I made was run to our schedule, run to our transportation schedule. I believe we'll get a billion, at least a billion dollars of savings out of that running forward. And this is the key connectivity to improving our service. Once we get all the mail on that on those trucks, then 97 to 98% of the mail that we move around the country will be getting to its destination point on time. That was not the case. It was significant, substantially less than that prior to my arrival. Those are the two changes, general uh, 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 committee, that I have uh, that I've made since I've since I've been here. Well, thank you, Mr. Postmaster General. I think you should be commended for this type of uh, initiative, not condemned. Uh, Senator Peters. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Joy again. Thank you uh, for, for being here today. You know, I just want to start off before asking some questions, just making it very clear that the, the, the men and women who work at the Postal Service, who check in every day to, to do their jobs, uh, do it with professionalism, with integrity, and, and a passion to move the mail as uh, quickly and as efficiently as possible. When I think of the postal workers, the mail handlers, uh, the, the letter carriers, uh, they're doing a great job. They are clearly essential workers uh, each uh, and every day. But as we've been going through this issue, and I've talked to many of uh, those folks across my state, they have grown increasingly frustrated with some of the recent policies that have come in place, which they say is nothing that they've seen uh, in the past, and they believe that mail has been piling up in ways uh, that it uh, shouldn't, uh, and it needs to be addressed. But these are management changes. These are policy changes. It's not the men and women who are on the front line doing this uh, this work uh, every day. So my my question, or uh, so Postmaster General DeJoy, you, you've already heard me in my opening comments talking about the fact that I've received over 7,500 complaints from folks all across Michigan, but really across the, the country. Folks have uh, sent in their concerns uh, to me. Uh, earlier uh, in my opening statement, uh, I shared some stories of hardships uh, from folks, both Beth and Mary, uh, their uh, their challenges uh, in Michigan. So, and, and I think I heard this in the last a answer. Do you you acknowledge that some of the changes that were put in place have delayed the mail, and with with a delay in mail, uh, people can sometimes be hurt. Is that true, uh, Senator? First of all, I, I do recognize the. The, the, the quality capability of, of, of the American postal worker. That's one of the reasons that I'm here uh, is to help, uh, as well as with regard to the, the Postal Service's uh, uh, key role in serving the American uh, American uh, public. Uh, yes, sir, I do uh, re recognize that some of these, that there's been two changes. The organizational change has had no, I don't believe has any impact on uh, what we've done, the transportation change, getting the compliance with us. Right. Mr. Has, Drum, let me uh, just jump. I don't want to mean to cut you off, but I'll, I'll get into those issues uh, because I want you to elaborate a little bit further. But you, there have been delays. You, you'll recognize that. You know, it's clear well, what we're seeing. Mail's been delayed, and I've spent over a month asking you to provide some documentation, kind of uh, in my oversight function here in this committee to. So well, how you made these decisions, what kind of analysis, what sort of data was put in place and for the, and how that information impacted some of the changes you have. Your staff uh, has repeatedly not answered those questions. And so certainly that transparency I think is, is unacceptable. The, uh, what I have uncovered though, from what little data is uh, made public by the Postal Service is on-time mail delivery. And I, I have my chart as well here too, which is uh, from the Eastern Division. This is what you give to your to your uh, uh, business uh, customers. And if you look at this line here, if it's probably hard to see, but there is a red line of which you can see uh, dipping dramatically. It, there's a flat line along the top of the chart, then it drops around July 11th, you start seeing the drop, July 18th, it falls dramatically. So that's a pretty big drop in on-time uh, mail delivery. 
uh, that we are, are seeing. And I've asked for, for three times since July 17th for records relating to these service changes and how what I'm hearing from our letter carriers and postal workers and what I'm seeing in the chart that you actually post on your website of significant drop of, of mail deliveries, and yet I don't get an answer. Will, will you commit to, to giving me these documents which have to be readily available to the Postal Service by this Sunday? Can we get those documents to get a sense of what went into these decisions and what you're seeing in terms of mail delivery? Uh, I will uh, meet with our staff and get what documents uh, with, with, with regard to this change. But the change, Senator, was to was to adhere to the tra transportation schedule. That was the change. So I, I would just but you, obviously you have all that documented. I'd love to see the documents as to how that was done, the the data supporting that. Uh, that yeah, was and, and if I if I if I can add, there's two, and certainly uh, uh, there was there was a there was a, a, a slowdown in, in the mail uh, when when our production did not meet the the, the schedule. But also, Senator, our employees are, are going, uh, are experiencing the COVID uh, pandemic also, and we have a significant, uh, uh, significant issue in employee availability in many, many parts of the country that are also leading to uh, uh, delays in delivery and mail. Let me uh, let me uh, turn to the, your recent announcement that you made uh, this week uh, that you are suspending some of the changes uh, that uh, you had made over the last month. I believe the statement's fairly vague uh, and it raises some additional questions. Uh, but I, so I want to just be clear. These would be yes or no, just so we know exactly what was intended by that. Are you suspending your policy eliminating extra trips? Yes or no? No. I, I did, first of all, the policy was not to eliminate extra trips. It was to mitigate extra trips. Okay, so, so now to that. Our, uh, we're being told that you're limiting overtime uh, and this uh, could possibly add to backlogs. Are you... Are you limiting overtime or is that being suspended right now and people will work overtime if necessary to move the mail out efficiently every single day? Senator, I, we never eliminated overtime. That's uh, it's been not, curtailed significantly is what I understand. It has not been curtailed by me or the leadership team here. Curtailed significantly, it's gone down, it's been limited. Will you commit I, to- Senator, spent seven, Since I've been here, we've spent $700 million on overtime. Overtime runs on a 13% rate before I got here, and it runs at a 13% rate now. I did not okay. suspend. If I have a policy, you can submit that to me. I'd appreciate it. Will yes. you commit that there will be no post office closures or suspensions before November 3rd? I confirm post office closures was not a directive I gave. That, that's, that what I gave. That was around before I got here. There's a process to that. Uh, when I found out about it, uh, and it, it had the... Uh, reaction uh, that that we did, uh, I, I've, I've, su I've suspended that till after the election. Well, uh, well, we've heard about the sorters. You addressed that earlier. Will you be bringing back any mail sorting machines that have been removed uh, since you've become Postmaster General? Will any of those come back? There's no intention to do that. They're not needed, sir. So you will not bring back any processors? They're not needed, sir. Okay. The... Um, I've got a, questions about independence and transparency. Uh, prior to implementing uh, the changes that you put forth in the postal system, did you discuss those changes or are there a potential impact on the November election with the president or anyone at the White House? And remind you, you're under oath. I have never spoken to the president about the Postal Service other than to congratulate me when I accepted the position. Did you speak or discuss any of these changes with Secretary Mnuchin? During the uh, during the discussion and negotiating the, uh, the note, I told them I have a I'm working on a plan, but I never discussed the changes that I made. I just said I'm working on a plan for, for uh, uh, to uh, to improve service and uh, uh, gain cost efficiencies. But no 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 grave detail other than uh, that that was about it. Prior to implementing the changes, did you discuss these changes or their impact on the election with any Trump campaign officials? No, no, sir. These if, sir, th these changes in our total analysis here and going forward, and, and remember, I'm one new person in the organization with this, with, with the whole structure around me, an operating structure, an executive team around me that are involved in these decisions. Okay, and uh, we, the, the having any moving forward, trying to have any negative impact on the on the election is an outrageous claim. Did, uh, just one final one. Did you ever, one final one, Mr. Chairman, did, did you ever discuss any of this with Mark uh, Meadows? Any of these changes no, that you've done? You've never no, had discussions since you've discussed anything with Mark Meadows. I haven't spoken to Mark Meadows 
uh, 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 up until uh, uh, maybe last week was the first time I spoke to him in a while. So, so finally, you, you will give us your word today under oath that uh, you have not taken any action whatsoever in your capacity as Postmaster General for any political reason or at the suggestion of any, any administration officials. Sir, I will tell you my first election mail meeting, what I instructed the organization, the whole team around us and out in the field, whatever efforts we will have, double them. I was greatly concerned about uh, of all, all the political uh, noise that we were hearing. And uh, uh, we have had, we, I've had weekly reviews on this since before this, uh, all the excitement came out. We, we are very committed, the board's committed, the postal workers committed, the union where our leadership is committed to having a successful election. And the, uh, uh, the insinuation is quite frankly outrageous. Just one final thing, Mr. Chairman, if I, Chairman just uh, is that we, as we get into the election now, there has been concern that I'm hearing uh, from state and local governments about uh, first class mail. Do you, do you have your word that you're not gonna mandate that states send out any ballots using either the more expensive uh, first class mail and will you continue the processes and procedures to allow uh, election mail to, to move uh, as uh, expeditiously as possible and treat it like first class? Yes, sir. Um, we, we will deploy processes and procedures that advance any election mail, in some cases ahead of first class mail. Okay, they, they won't charge local governments uh, for the first class mail. They can continue the process that they've done in the past. I, I don't get to charge anybody, uh, but no, we're not going to change any. We're not going to change any rights. Right. Thank, thank you for the time. Thank you for the indulgence, Mr. Chairman, for the extra time. Appreciate it. Well, thanks, Senator Peters. Now, I, we did allow seven-minute rounds. Uh, both Senator Peters and I went a little over. Uh, we're going to adhere to the seven minutes uh, to other members. The order of questioning will be Senator Portman, Carper, Langford, Hassan, Scott, Rosen, and then uh, Senator Portman. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and thank you and to Senator Peters for holding the hearing. It's very important. It's timely. Obviously, all of us want to see our Postal Service work and work well. And let me just uh, give a shout out to David Janus, who's our letter carrier, and to all the letter carriers and all the postal workers, because I do think particularly during this pandemic, uh, they're more appreciated than ever. And so the men and women who you lead, uh, Mr. DeJoy, uh, please pass along to them our, our, our thanks. Um, I like having this hearing now because I think there's been a lot of misinformation out there and I like getting to the facts. One of the facts I've learned this morning is that you started 67 days ago and much of what we've been talking about in the in the media at least, including the blue boxes and the sorting machines, uh, you know, that happened before you got there and it was part of a plan. I knew the former Postmaster General, she came up through the ranks, uh, was not a political person at all. And uh, anyway, that's that's helpful to know that that's what's going on. It's also helpful to know that you were appointed by the Postal Board of Governors uh, and that that's a bipartisan group. In fact, uh, we confirmed those people and uh, it was a unanimous selection. And I guess it's based on your being a, a logistics expert. And just hearing you this morning, I can tell you got a passion for the logistics side of things. Um, I also know that the long-term financial picture for the post office, uh, postal service is not pretty. And by the way, that's been true for a long, long time. And that's not really something that a postmaster general can do much about. It requires legislation. Uh, Senator Collins, Senator Feinstein have a bill as an example right now that provides for some reforms and some additional funding. Uh, everybody knows it's in trouble. Everybody knows we've got to deal with this issue. And so, uh, although I'm gonna ask you some, some tough questions and others will, uh, really, a lot of this comes back on to Congress and not doing its job uh, in terms of the longer term financial picture. But the immediate issue is to be sure that these elections work well. And I appreciate the fact that you said this morning that that's going to be your top priority between now and the election. Every one of us on this panel, I hope, want to be sure that we have the ability to have an election that is uh, well run, where people have their votes counted and many are gonna be using the Postal Service. Let me start, Mr. DeJoy, by just asking you a general question. Do you support absentee voting and do you support voting by mail generally? Um, um, I wanna vote uh, by mail. Yes. I voted by mail for a number of years. The Postal Service will deli deliver every ballot and process every ballot in, 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 in time that it receives. 
Well, I appreciate I appreciate that. So you you do support voting by mail. I do. That's yeah. interesting. <laughs> I think the American public should be able to vote by mail, and postal service will uh, 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 will, uh, will 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 support. It. So I guess that's yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, look. I mean, the, the states are going to decide this, not uh, not the Congress or not uh, the post office, and. And many states are going to do it. I mean, in Ohio, we've had absentee voting for a couple of decades now. It's no fault, meaning that uh, you don't have to give a reason. And it works quite well. Uh, I vote every year uh, by absentee uh, because I don't know where the heck I'm going to be in Washington or in Ohio based on our schedule. So it's worked well. And, uh, you know, we also are going to have in Ohio a lot of other ways for people to vote. We're going to be sure that it's easy to vote in Ohio and it's hard to cheat in Ohio. And I think that's it's the important thing. There's been a lot of news coverage about the Postal Service sending letters to 46 states, including Ohio and D.C., to let them know they can't guarantee all ballots cast by mail will arrive on time. Is this due to a lack of funding, which is what many are saying, or is it due to state laws on voting and the time it takes to turn around receiving and delivering the ballots? Uh, Senator, the, uh, this was not a change from anything that we have done in previous years. It was just more, more, more detail and more emphasis put on it, uh, uh, mostly because, partly because of the expected rise in vote by mail and also the uh, uh, the, the pandemic. And what uh, what the team set out to do is make the election boards and then eventually the American public pretty simple. You know what are, what our processes were. And therefore, to guarantee that you're, if you follow these processes, there was no extra Herculean efforts on our part to get your ballot in, which therefore mitigated the risk of it potentially not getting there. Yeah. So the mailing. Well, I think I think that's important to note that this is something that has been a problem for years, including previous elections. You sent out warnings in previous elections, and look, I think the post office has got to coordinate better with state election systems. I think state election systems has got to coordinate better with the post office. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, in, in Ohio, as an example of, you know, the time frame between when you can cast your ballot and when it is postmarked uh, and you can get a ballot as, as, as late as Saturday before the election and, um, you know, to get that to the post office and back to you and then date stamp before Monday is very hard to, very hard to do logistically. I think that's one of the things that your letter pointed out was to these state systems, be sure and leave adequate time. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. First of all, it was not my letter. It was a letter from uh, our general counsel. But yeah, pointing out all the different uh, variations that we could experience and how fast we could process it. But yes, there are times we get the ballots. Ballots were sent uh, out uh, the day before the election. It's almost impossible to for us to uh, for the voter to vote for the for the for the ballot to get to the voter for the voter to vote and for it to get back in time for the for the election. So this was uh, a, a very, very well thought out effort to safeguard the election, not to get in the way of, uh, safeguard the processing of uh, ballots, not to get in the way of it. Uh, what advice would you give voters? This is an opportunity for you to speak to uh, the voters of Ohio and the country. Uh, would you advise them to wait till the last minute? Or would you advise them to leave at least, least a week? The general word around here is vote, vote early. Vote, yeah. vote I think that's really important to tell people because, you know, it, again, under Ohio's law and a lot of other laws, the time frame is really close. If you request an absentee ballot, you got to be sure that it can be delivered in, in time. Uh, I am concerned about the delays that we have seen in Ohio and elsewhere. Uh, we have a number of veterans who've contacted us and said they weren't able to get their medication. And there's some just heartbreaking stories. Uh, one is a 70 year old surgeon in Vietnam, has COPD, has trouble breathing. The inhaler uh, refill was mailed through the Postal Service due to delays. Uh, he ran out of it while waiting for it to arrive. And then his insurance said, you know what? We're not gonna pay for another refill to be filled because it's already been shipped through the Postal Service. And he can't afford to pay for another emergency refill personally. Um, let me ask you about that, particularly the veterans medications that are shipped through, through the mail. Are you focused on that issue and what can we do to correct that problem? Uh, Senator, first of all, I am, uh, uh, we are working here feverish, feverishly to get uh, 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 the, the system uh, running in, 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 at stability and also to get more, uh, uh, hire more workers to handle the delivery uh, 
uh, process. And it is, uh, we're, we're all uh, 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 feel, you know, uh, bad about, you know, what the, uh, the debt in our service level has been. We, we serve 161 million people. Uh, we still deliver at 99.5% uh, of, 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 of the time. We have uh, 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 significant efforts to, uh, uh, to continue to improve on, uh, on that process. And everybody is working here feverish, feverishly to, uh, 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 to, to get that right. Well, I hope you will, and let's ensure these medications are delivered in time and, and be sure that when the production doesn't meet the transportation schedule, as you said earlier, that there are some efforts made to align those two because it's a lifeline for people uh, you know, all over the country, uh, particularly in our rural areas. And uh, I thank you for your service and for the answers you give today. Thanks, Senator Portman. Again, I want to just remind our committee members, please keep your questioning as well as uh, factor in the answer to try and keep it within those seven minutes. Senator Carper. Is Senator Carper there? We'll move on to uh, Senator Langford. Mark, oh, fuck, 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 fuck. Oh, Mr. Chairman, I think Senator Carper is there. I think he's okay. trying to be able to queue it all okay. up right now. Senator Carper, can you unmute? I'm un I'm unmuted. Okay, Mr. there Chairman? we go. We, we don't want to be on TV uh, again. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much for uh, scheduling this hearing. I urged you to do this three weeks ago. You agreed to do it, and I'm grateful that you have. Uh, to uh, the Postmaster General, thank you for finally returning my call. I called you for like three weeks, trying to get you to return my call after you take an office. Thank you for finally returning our call and talking with us last uh, last week. You know. You, you might be wondering, Mr. DeJoy, why there's some question and skepticism here. I've seen in my own office on co constituent service, we get constituent service report every week. We've seen uh, a, a steady upbeat, upbeat, upgrade and increase in concerns, complaints about postal service. And it's not just my office, it's Senate offices and House offices all over the country. And frankly, they coincided with the time that you took office. Even this morning, I just got a, a message from Joe Manchin, Senator from West Virginia. Been uh, earlier this week in the Charleston uh, Mail Distribution Center talking about how all this uh, equipment, sorting equipment, has been taken out. They serve five states from out of that place, and uh, so it's it's not just a little hello. It's all over the country. Maybe it's just a um, maybe it's just a coincidence. I'm not so sure. But here's why here's why we're skeptical. We got a president who doesn't want to have vote by mail. We got a president who likes to suppress the vote. We got a president who would uh, would like to see the postal postal service not do well. I worked for almost 20 years on this committee to try to make sure we have a vibrant, active, meaningful uh, postal service. You come from uh, you come from uh, uh, Greensboro, uh, uh, North Carolina, just yeah. north of uh, just south of where I was, uh, where I grew up in Danville, Virginia. Uh, we had voter suppression in this country almost from the get-go. Even though our first postmaster general, uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin, said, "No, we're not going to do that. We're going to let everybody have you know fr freedom and right to choose their own votes." It hadn't been that way. Women didn't get the vote. Blacks didn't get the vote. We still have voter suppression. The last con congressional election they had in North Carolina, you know what happened? Half the people voted for Democratic candidates for Congress. Do you know how many Democrats were elected out of 13 seats? Three. I mean, we have seen poll taxes. We have seen literacy tests, all this stuff. And when I see what's going on with the president who wants to degrade the Postal Service, wants to get rid of vote by mail, you shouldn't be surprised that, that uh, we're alarmed when we see the kind of de degraded service that we're seeing across the country. It wasn't that long ago, we had an overnight mail service in metropolitan area. It wasn't that long ago, we had from coast to coast, mail delivered within three days, and we don't have that anymore. So people should be, if people seem skeptical, they have a right to be skeptical. I, uh, I wanna, I wanna uh, just say, after the, the public uproar that we've seen uh, here in, in, in my state and other states about uh, de delays and failure to deliver the mail, you committed to freeze additional operational changes until after the election. Good, but we're going to need more information than that, especially given reports that came out last night showing that you and your team are actually considering more extreme changes than those we've seen today, including changes that will slow down the mail even further, post office and plant closing, massive service reductions to Alaska, Hawaii and Puerto Rico, making mail more expensive to the US citizens living there, price changes,
that would uh, nearly double uh, the, uh, the, co the cost for price changes that would double the cost of voting by mail. Dramatic price uh, hikes on packages that will disproportionately impact small businesses in rural communities that rely on the Postal Service while erasing your competitive advantage over FedEx and UPS. We need to be worried about this, and I am. I, I don't ask a lot of yes or no questions. I'm gonna ask you a couple today, and I'd ask you just give me a simple yes or no answer. We will have an opportunity and responses for the record to expand on those, but I'm gonna ask you for yes or no answers. Yes or no, are you considering the dramatic service changes that I just outlined, which we've just learned about in the last 48 hours? Are you considering those dramatic service changes? Just yes or no? Senator, there's a dramatic, dramatic I ask, I'm asking for a yes or no answer. We're considering, yes we're considering no answer. dramatic changes to improve the service to the American people. Yes. Yes or no, will you restore the mail collection and processing capacity that the Postal Service has lost in recent weeks during your tenure? Uh, Senator, as I said, I did not direct that. I directed it, I stopped it. It's insignificant, it's not material to any thing that we do and um, it, we're sticking with the, wh where we're at right now. Recently, the president though was caught red-handed when he admitted to not wanting the Postal Service to have additional resources because he had, uh, the, the Postal Service would use these resources to enable uh, election mail. And when asked about providing necessary relief, the president stated, quote, if we don't make a deal, that is a deal with the Congress, uh, that means they don't get the money, they being the Postal Service. That means they don't uh, get universal mail in voting. They just can't have it. No wonder we're somewhat skeptical and, and, and dubious. My, uh, my understanding is you have had more than a passing acquaintance with this president. My understanding you've been a huge supporter financially of the president. My understanding is when you're going to have a convention in, Char uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina, you were invo heavily involved in leading the raising of money for that, uh, for that convention. No wonder we're a little bit skeptical about this when we have a president talking down the Postal Service, and talking down vote by mail. Another yes or no. And uh, you can re expand on, on expand on the record on this. Uh, Senator, yes, you know, will you Senator, remain the not here to talk about political and make political service decisions matter. and support the American pe uh, people first? Will you? That's, that's services that support the American people having fast, efficient, and afford affordable mail service, especially with regard to mail-in ballots. Will you make uh, remain independent of this administration? That's Senator, it. Will you remain independent? Yes, I'm. And we'll, we'll remain independent of this. Thank you very much. Mr. DeJoy, during our call earlier this week, you said that you support additional cash assistance for the Postal Service. So do we. The Postal Service has, you know, $15 billion of roughly cash on hand and a new billion dollar line of $10 billion line of credit that comes with some very troubling conditions uh, dictated by the administration. The Postal Service has had massive declines in first class mail. We know that the average is 15, 20 percent below last year's first class mail volume. The Postal Service package volume is higher, though. Normal and has sustained it through the pandemic. My guess is those volumes will come down somewhat after the pandemic. All this is to say the Postal Service's $15 billion in cash uh, uh, balance uh, could quickly disappear. And I believe the Post Office needs to approve the, boat. the Board of Governors' $15 billion request from earlier this year to cover loss of COVID. Lost of COVID. Last yes or no question Do you support the federal appropriation of the Postal Service to cover its COVID related losses? Yes or no? Do you support the federal appropriation to the Postal Service to cover its COVID-related losses. Yes, COVID-related losses I do support. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Pat, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, my Postmaster General, uh, my family's had a heavy military involvement throughout our lives. I'm a vet, last Vietnam veteran serving in the United States Senate. My, my uh, mother's uh, youngest brother died in a kamikaze attack in 1944 on his aircraft carrier in the Western Pacific. He gave his life for this country. My grandmother's the gold star mother. We have my father's a veteran, I'm a veteran. We have generation after generation of Americans who have been willing to risk their lives, lay down their lives, so we will have the right to vote. We got a lot of people who are sick and afraid of going out and voting this year because they don't want to stand in lines and come down with a virus that could take their life. This is a serious matter. And uh, I just want you to urge with us, urge you to work with us, not by be apart from us, not return our calls, work with us as we attack uh, the needs to, the, to build the kind of postal service that we can all be proud of. Thanks very much. Senator Frankford. Chairman, thank you. Mr. DeJoy, thank you uh, for your service. Uh, from what I've heard so far today, uh, apparently the post office never had any issues. There was never any delays. There was never any mail that was late. There were never any financial problems. There was never any challenge to mail-in votings until 65 days ago when you arrived. 
and then apparently all chaos has broken out in the post office in the last two months. But uh, before that, there seemed to be no complaint about the post office ever. Uh, so I do want to thank you for your service. I want to thank the men and women that are around the country that do a remarkable job every day. Uh, those folks in the unions, those folks that are uh, taking care of us and getting things out, getting medicine, uh, taking care of first class mail, taking care of all those things. So I appreciate your service. I appreciate the fact that you have stepped up to be able to help lead an organization that desperately needs some help, that uh, Congress has for two decades pounded on postmasters on why they are not doing reforms and why we haven't found more efficiencies. You've stepped into this role and have taken the, looks like the work from the Inspector General and spoke uh, the work from the uh, Regulatory uh, Commission and have said, let's start implementing some of these things. And now Congress seems to be shifting from beating up on postmasters for not doing work to now beating up on you for actually doing the work. Uh, so I do want to say thanks for stepping up and taking the risk uh, to actually take this on. So I, I do want to run through several questions. Uh, some of them uh, have not been addressed yet. There was a, a series of stories that came out uh, and a trending on social media that uh, you were locking up the post boxes in Burbank to prevent people from voting. Were you locking up the boxes in Burbank to keep people from voting? Senator, the, the, the stories that I have uh, uh, heard of my, my, my ability and the places I'm able to get to in the same day are just uh, remarkable. Uh, so no, I'm not locking up any, I would have nothing to do with collection boxes. So you mentioned earlier that it's been 35,000 of the blue boxes that have been retired over the past 10 years. Uh, so uh, apparently any blue boxes that have been retired over the past 10 years are your responsibility over the last 65 days. Uh, you, you had mentioned before about some of the blue boxes being retired. Are they still going to be retired between now and the election or will they be retired in the future? Now, my, my commitment to uh, the committee and the leadership uh, and the American people is we stop. We have uh, the day I put the, the, the statement out, we, we directed everybody to stop on, on stop reducing postal hours, stop collect, you know, bringing back collection boxes, uh, stop shutting down machines, and uh, that that was basically what we did. So that from now so until stop that, yes, yeah, you stop that until the election. Will that pick back up after the election? Because one of the issues that you brought up before was about the sorting machines. Some of these sorting machines uh, are older. Uh, some of the sorting machines are are not needed anymore. Will that just stop forever? Uh, what I'm trying to figure out is. Are we still going to work on trying to build in efficiencies in the post office? This has been a, this has been an issue for a long time to try to get us back into balance. Senator, right now, the thank you for the opportunity. Right now, the law, it, the legislation is that we deliver to 161 address, 161 million addresses, six days a week. I'm committed to that. I believe that's the strength of the postal service, uh, uh, and uh, uh, that we be self-sustaining. Those are the two pieces of legislation that I'm, I'm working towards. Uh, after the, we are not self-sustained. Uh, we have a $10 billion shortfall and we'll continue to have, over the next 10 years, we'll have a $245 billion shortfall. Uh, so we need to, we need to, and our management team and our board need, there, there is a path that we are planning, okay, with, you know, with the help of some legislation uh, with some some cost impacts, with some new revenue strategies, um, and uh, uh, that will uh, uh, help help uh, and some pricing freedom from the uh, from the PRC. We believe we we have a plan to, to to do that. But one thing that's not in the plan is not doing anything after the election. It is a, an a ambitious plan because we have ten billion dollars to bridge. Now the plan has not been finalized. We have hundreds of initiatives we we look like like take the Alaska uh, uh, bypass plan the discussion, that's an item on the table. There's two, that's an unfunded mandate. It costs us like $500 million a year. And if, if I'm not saying, it's, it, what I asked for is all the unfunded mandates, right? That's a way for us to get healthy, pay, pay, pay something for the unfunded mandates. If we just throw 25 billion at us this year uh, and we don't do anything, we'll be back in two years. If then maybe we should change the legislation and not make us be self-sustaining. But as a leadership team and a board, that's what our mission is, to be self-sustaining and deliver at a high level of, 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 of precision. And I'm committed to both. I'm committed to both. And I think both can be done with a little help 
from the from the from the from the Congress and from the uh, Postal Regulatory. Well, Congress has been unwilling to be able to act on this uh, for a very long time. It's been over a decade. Congress has discussed any kind of reforms in the post office, but it always seems to boil down to will that change uh, distribution areas that may may or may not be needed in a state that I live in, or will it change any other post office uh, structure that I'm familiar with? And uh, if it changes my area, then I, I want to be able to block it. And uh, so it has been a great challenge. I've also heard from multiple folks saying the post office has now so severely cut uh, that they can't meet the capacity to actually get ballots out. And folks in rural areas and folks in urban areas, will they be able to get ballots out? I've seen your letter that was the same as the letter in 2016 the post office sent out uh, saying, hey, be advised states, you need to send things out early. That's helpful. Uh, thanks for actually doing that. And you shouldn't be criticized for that. You should be encouraged uh, to be able to, uh, to do that. Uh, but uh, my question is, Folks have challenged me and said there's not going to be enough capacity for elections. Will you have enough capacity again for Christmas and for Mother's Day? Because my understanding is Christmas and Mother's Day are the biggest capacity times for first class mail. Do you have capacity now for Christmas and Mother's Day? Uh, we thank you. We have, uh, yes, we have capacity for um, Christmas and Mother's Day. So I actually went back and looked last year, December, the week of December the 16th, the post office delivered two and a half billion pieces of first class mail just that one week of December the 16th of last year. That's a pretty remarkable feat to get two and a half billion pieces of first class mail delivered in one single week. So you know right now you have enough capacity to be able to handle the elections without yes. slowing it down. Yes, sir. And it's more than that. Besides just the capacity, the the intent, the the extra activities that the whole organization is going through between our postal union leaders, our board, the executive management team here, uh, we are focused on, uh, besides just having the capacity to execute, uh, uh, to, re to react to whatever, uh, uh, whatever conditions it, it exist at that particular point in, in, in time, up to and including uh, the, the pandemic, which likely we'll still be having some some impacts. So I think the American people can uh, feel comfortable that the Postal Service will deliver on this election. Thank you. Thanks, Senator uh, Langford. Uh, Senator Hassan. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ranking Member Peters, for having this hearing. And thank you, Mr. DeJoy, for your willingness to appear before our committee today. My time is short this morning. And because I've been told you won't be staying for a second round of questions, I'd appreciate brief responses. Um, Mr. DeJoy, I sent you a letter last week detailing stories from Granite Staters about delays in their mail. And I will note a huge spike in calls to my office since mid-July about the Postal Service and delays. For so many of our service members, veterans, people who experience disabilities, and rural Americans, their local post office is their lifeline. And I'll note that the change in volume you are seeing doesn't change the need for timely delivery of the essential necessary items that the American public relies on the post office for. For example, one Manchester couple fills prescriptions through their VA benefits, and they wrote, quote, there has been a noticeable slowdown in mail delivery. Mail delays have caused me to ration my medication. I start cutting back on my dosage to half pills or skipping alternate days to make them last. Some of my pills are crucial. My cardiac and diabetic meds need to be on a strict protocol. Will you ensure that any further changes that you make to postal operations do not delay access to medications and other necessities, yes or no? Yes, yes, Senator. And I look forward to working with you on legislation to help this type of service uh, not reach into the future. Well, thank you. Uh, now, I wanna move to elections again. I am uh, glad for some of the statements and actions you have taken. Uh, we all know how important um, voting by mail is usually, and this year even more so. Some states are starting to mail out general election ballots on September 4th, just two weeks from today. You and the Postal Service General Counsel have written letters that we've talked about this morning about your plans to deal with election mail. You wrote last week that the Postal Service will, quote, utilize additional resources and maximize our efforts during the 10 days prior to the election to ensure the processing and delivery of all election mail within our system. Do the letters that you and the general counsel have sent to Congress so far 
contain your full plan for ensuring the processing and delivery of all election mail? Or do you have a more detailed operational plan for the additional resources and efforts you alluded to? Uh, the, the letter that's been sent to the states from uh, general counsel speaks about uh, com you know, comply mail, mail classifications and how but, they process. Right, Mr. DeJoy, I'm just wondering, do you have a detailed plan about how you're going to ensure the kind of delivery that Americans count on for their for voting by mail. Do you have a more detailed plan than what's in your letter? Yes or no? There, there are detailed there are detailed processes that we are going through. We just ex and there are going to be expanded plans to that. We've just announced the expanded uh, 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 expanded committee uh, election committee within the operation, and our board has established one. But there are de there are detailed plans that we go through in every election. And with regards well, could you to share those uh, again, could you share those with Congress? And could you share them by Sunday night so we can see what they are, please? I, I don't think I will have the complete plan by Sunday night. Uh, we're just putting these committees together. Uh, but uh, I, I can share you. I, we can try and well, today's Friday. I, I I have to check and we'll get back to you. All right. We I would appreciate them by Sunday night, if possible, by the end of next week. As I noted, uh, September 4th, some of the ballots are going to start going out. Uh, last year, the Postal Service Inspector General interviewed managers and postal facilities across the country about handling elections. The Inspector General found that facilities typically process political mail as first class mail, delivering more than 95% of election mail with one to three days for the 2018 midterms. Yes or no, will you commit to the goal of delivering at least 95% of election mail within one to three days this year, the same as the Postal Service did in 2018? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Now I want to move on to the issue of these, the decommissioning of sorting machines. At the Manchester Processing and Distribution Facility in my state, four sorting machines have been taken out of service. Three of them are just sitting there, and I'm told that one of them has been dismantled and sold to a company in Pennsylvania for scrap metal. The Manchester facility only has one other machine that can do the work of the machine that has been sold for scrap. If that machine fails, like it did yesterday when I was talking to postal workers in my state, sorting stops and mail is delayed until the machine can be fixed. Although you've suspended the removal of sorting machines, the removed machines in Manchester have yet to be brought back in service or replaced. And you've said today that it isn't necessary to do that and there aren't any plans to do that. In fact, I understand that the Director of Maintenance Operations, Kevin Couch, sent an email on Tuesday directing local maintenance managers not to reconnect machines. Yes or no, is that true? I have no idea about that, ma'am. That is, that, that those op maintenance operations are still, they're, they're maintenance operations within the districts. Uh, uh, this whole process was uh, uh, new to me last week. Uh, I'm sure there's logic behind what it is. I can find out about well, that. Well, I'd be happy to okay. guess. So, so you've already said though today that it's not necessary. But look, when we have only one machine that can do a certain kind of sorting in our largest distribution center in the state of New Hampshire, and it breaks and everything has to stop till it gets fixed again, that's not efficient, that delays delivery. And what I would like to get from you is a plan uh, to make sure uh, that you will commit uh, to making sure that postal workers can deliver every piece of mail that comes into the distribution center on the same day it gets in there, which has been the practice in the past. Um, by refusing to restart or replace these machines, you're really sabotaging the Postal Service's ability to sort mail efficiently, and you're undermining postal workers' commitment to that everyday delivery. Um, so will you commit to having your team look into this and get back to me in writing about what the plan is to get at least some of these decommissioned machines back up and running? Yes. Well, I, first, Senator, I don't agree with the premise, but I will comply with your request. Well, thank you. And uh, it would be helpful to get uh, a response by the end of uh, the week. And finally, um, I will just, uh, because I see that I am running out of time, uh, I will ask a question for the record, uh, because there are growing concerns that postal workers are being retaliated against when they speak to their members of Congress or to the press about some of the shortages that they are seeing uh, or some of the delays they're seeing, some of the sabotage and undermining 
uh, of timely delivery that they are seeing. And I want to make sure uh, that postal workers who are speaking uh, to protect the interests of the American public that they serve with such diligence are not retaliated against for doing so. Uh, can I have your commitment today that they will not be retaliated against for doing so? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Scott. Sure. Uh, thank you, um, Chairman Johnson, for holding this uh, hearing today. Thank you, Postmaster General Joy, for being here. Um, in Florida, we've had we've had um, uh, vote by mail for a long time, and it's worked really well. And I think the post office in Florida has done a great job in making sure it's worked. I've had three elections, and everyone, it's it's uh, they've worked they've worked hard to make it happen. Mr. DeJoy, can you just talk about why you're uniquely qualified? It's it's uh, they've worked they've worked hard to make it happen. Mr. DeJoy, can you just talk about why you're uniquely qualified and what background you bring to be in Postmaster General uh, as you and why you were picked by uh, the the, uh, the board of uh, uh, the Postal Service? <laughs> uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, I mean, there's, there's two things, and you could look at, you know, the two actions, the big actions that I've, uh, I've taken. I mean, the board will have to speak for their evaluation uh, of me, but I do have, I have um, uh, done, I think one of the things they like is my experience with large program, large logistical transformations. I've done a, a great, I've done back in the 90s, over a $3 billion transformation of the postal network uh, regarding uh, mail transport equipment. I've done big projects for uh, Boeing, big projects for Disney, big projects for, uh, um, for transformational projects for, for Verizon. So that particular you know type of experience, I think, uh, uh, um, impressed them. And I, uh, 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 my commitment to public service, uh, I, 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 I think, you know, impressed them. My, my, my uh, engagement in, in community and in, in in the nation um and it, it when you look at the the steps that i made, i didn't come in here with a team i didn't bring in consultants i worked with the existing management team to uh create an organization that would look to move forward and help give us self-help and drive uh, uh improvements in our service uh drive costs out of the system um, and and grow revenues, and that is something that I've done all my life. I built a big business from nothing, uh, and uh, we people, you know, there's some accusations that this is not a business. But when you have to deliver service and you have to be sustainable, uh, the operating mod model needs to cover its cost. There is no other answer to that than than those than that, and we need to take actions uh, to do that. And I'm. Uh, I have great experience at, 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 at that. And part of, I think, why they like me is because I have a plan. I have a plan for the success of the Postal Service. I believe in the six day, I believe the six day a week delivery is an important aspect, a strength in us. Uh, now, well, our, our, our pieces per delivery are down under three now uh, from uh, years ago, six or seven. Our goal is to get that, get that back up. We cover uh, if you looked on a chart and look at, is at where our, what, what our reach is on a daily basis, it is impressive, and uh, we 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 need to um, drive our costs out of the. And this is well known. This is not this is study. We need to drive drive our costs out of the network, get more efficient within our network, and get more pieces into our carriers' uh, hands. And that's that's the success, along with along with uh, you know legislative help. Uh, that that will be the future success for the, for the Postal Service as we face a new economy. So, Mr. DeJoy, in your business in your business life, did uh, were you did you have to um, perform for your customer? Did you have to be on time? And did uh, were you able to do that? <laughs> Sir, our, our, our contracts had ninety nine point nine eight percent performance metrics on on uh, uh, everything we did. Yes, and. Uh, I, I think there's a. I think there's. I think that the attitude and the the energy is is here at the postal, and the desire is here at the postal service to you know to do that. I just think that we we haven't had the alignment and the expectation of that, and that's something that I, I, I bring to the table. So, are you? Um, I mean, you personally committed to doing everything you can to make sure the mail is delivered on time and people get whether it's their medicine or their ballot. Uh, that they get it as quickly as they can. 
uh, under with realistic expectations? Yes, sir, I am. Right. So how does it make you feel when you have people out here that make these uh, unsubstantiated claims that you personally uh, have a goal to slow down the mail so ballots don't get uh, uh, don't get to uh, election offices on time that you want to suppress the vote uh, that you know you personally are are interested in damaging uh, the ability of the post office to do their job. <laughs> so that that does not deter me at all. And you would be in you would be I am unbelievably proud and humbled by the number of positive comments I get from employees, the management team, and the people from around uh, you know from around America on my initiatives. It is, uh, it is really a farce to believe that we can sit here and do nothing. Yep. Do, you, um, do you feel like you need a massive federal bailout to be able to deliver the mail on election day? <laughs> no, I do not need a, a massive, I don't need a, a anything to deliver a mail uh, on uh, 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 election night, but we do need legislative reform uh, we do need the freedom from the from uh, the change in the PRC regulation, uh, and we do need to be we do need to be reimbursed for our costs. When when you look at during the COVID uh, uh, during the pandemic, we still delivered to 99 percent of the American homes where other business and in, in during with, with no revenue uh, with no revenue. The, the American postal worker was out there that this organization continued to perform and this is why we've had such high ratings. While our revenues were down, other organizations would have stopped going into some of these rural areas and, and so forth. Uh, well, we, we continue to uh, 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 do what we're supposed to do and uh, uh, at, at, at a significant cost impact. And I'm, you know, I'm one to try and get to uh, a, sustain, a sustainable model. Uh, but in this, in this case, uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we, I, I believe we deserve uh, uh, some compensation for it. Well, one thing I, I think a lot of us would like uh, to be able to do, if we're going to provide uh, more funding to the post office, that we are, I'd like to work with you and others to find out what are the things that we ought to do to, to make the changes necessary to make sure that you can do your job in the future. So I appreciate any information you could provide uh, that would allow us to do that. And I just want to thank you for your commitment. I, uh, I want to thank all the people that work at the post office. Uh, they work hard. Uh, they, uh, so, uh, but I will appreciate uh, your background, your commitment to excellence, and I hope you can do the same thing uh, over time at the post office. Uh, thank you, Chairman Johnson. Thanks, Senator Scott. Uh, Senator Rosen. Uh, thank you, Chairman Johnson, for uh, holding this meeting here today. And uh, thank you, Mr. DeJoy, for making yourself available. Uh, before I ask uh, some further questions, I want to ask the Postmaster General, I'd like to ask you this. We need transparency in the changes you've been making and in everything that you've discussed here today. Will you commit to providing this committee with any and all transcripts or minutes of all closed, non-public Board of Governor meetings from this year by this Sunday? And you commit to that, sir? No. You will not commit to provide minutes. I don't know. I don't know. How, I don't have the authority to do some of those things, and that that is something um, that I would need to discuss with council and the board's council. So I can't commit to that. Well, we'll be discussing that with you. But let's move on. We have limited time. Uh, before I go with the rest of my questions, I do want to thank the dedicated postal workers across this nation, particularly here in my state of Nevada. I spoke uh, with many of them yesterday, majority of them veterans, veterans in their family. They have done years of dedicated service to this country, to this nation, and they are very concerned. To Mr. DeJoy, earlier this year, you've acknowledged you've made operational changes to the Postal Service remove mail sorting machines. You've had reduction, elimination of overtime and late trips. In Las Vegas, where we're expecting mail volume to ramp up soon, 
our postal workers, the ones I spoke with yesterday, are reporting the removal of sorting machine from our general mail facility, which is actually right down the street from my house. As a former programmer and systems analyst, I have a real strong appreciation for the data. So I want to talk about the data that you use to create these policies and uh, what you may or may not have analyzed before you've made these changes. During the pandemic, health officials, we've directed older Americans to stay at home for their own safety. That means for our seniors in Nevada and across the country, postal service is the only way they're going to receive their critical items. Life-saving prescription, household supplies, social security checks. For veterans, my colleagues have already mentioned this. It's a lifeline. 80% of veterans' prescriptions are filled by the United States Postal Service. I have 225,000 veterans in Nevada, many of them relying on this for their timely delivery of life-saving medication. And in small towns across Nevada, from Gabs, who has a population of 269 people, to Shores, it's a tribal community with 658 people, some of my larger rural communities, that's all they get is the Postal Service. So please, could you answer yes or no? Effort of time. Before developing and implementing policy changes since assuming your role this year, did you conduct any specific analysis on how your changes would Im impact seniors yes or no sir so ma'am the policy changes that i yes or no sir the policy changes that i embarked upon uh were, were not the ones that you identified in your uh, uh, so you didn't do any analysis to see how seniors would be impacted okay let's move on did you do an analysis to see how veterans might be impacted knowing knowing that so many of our, actually our postal workers are veterans. We employ so many veterans uh, that they aren't getting their medication and that they rely on 80%. Did you do a specific analysis to see how veterans would be impacted? The only change that I made, ma'am, was that the trucks leave on time. Theoretically, everyone should have got their mail faster. So you can can you look me in the eye and all the nevada veterans in the eye all the nevada seniors in the eye and tell us that you will not continue in the policies in the future that you know that will harm my seniors my veterans here in nevada and all of our seniors and veterans across this nation can you look us in the eye and commit to being sure that they have on time delivery well I, i'm working towards on time delivery ma'am yes i can commit to that thank you and so did you do any analysis about the fees if, the, if mail is late the late fees that people would get when they paid their rent or their car payment or their utility bill if the mail is slowed down and the impact that the charges and those fees would have on working families is there any analysis about the impact of late delivery by you on that sir yes or no please the analysis that we did was that if we move the mail on schedule that all late deliveries would have been improved that's the well, obviously that that isn't the case so we need to continue for, this for a variety uh, of reasons for a variety so of reasons did you uh you know our deployed service members routinely cast their ballots by mail did you uh specifically analyze how your policy changes would impact our service men and women across this country and across the globe how your changes would impact them sir Senator, the, the analysis we did would show that we would improve service to every constituent. So that's great. So can you provide me by this Sunday, if I understand you correctly, you have an analysis that will show that this should have improved it, although we are finding out through thousands and thousands of contacts to our office, to our connections, that it has not been the case. So this is frankly unacceptable, and I would like to see the analysis that this was based on to our offices by this Sunday. Can you commit to that, sir? No, ma'am. Can you commit to providing it to us at all, sir? Um, I can, I will get back to you on that. I would- You I cannot would say, commit to I, providing the American yes. people the analysis that you use to base your decisions on about their very important medications, their social security checks and all, all the other things. You won't commit to the American people to be transparent? Senator, I will go back and get the, the truck schedule, the analysis that designed the truck schedule that I directed the- Can you commit to transparency, sir? That's all I'm asking. Very transparent. 
then yes, that means that you would provide us your analysis. If you're transparent, then ergo, that means you will provide us the data that you use to base these important decisions that impact people's lives. I want you to look in the camera. There are millions of people watching who are impacted every day by what you do. And please understand that. And so I want you to commit to the American people to transparency and provide us with the data that has been used to create these decisions. Uh, Ma'am, I, I do not accept the premise, and I will provide you with the transportation schedule that I directed the uh, uh, organization to adhere to. Yes, I will do that. Well, we appreciate that. I look forward to seeing that. I look forward to having uh, future discussions with you. Thank you, my time is up. Is Senator Paul available? Yes, uh, do you have me? Senator Paul, yep, we can hear you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Joy, for your testimony. And thank you for taking what sounds like an often thankless job full of partisan rancor. And thanks for bringing your business acumen to something that really probably, from my opinion, is almost an impossible problem, uh, short of legislative reform. And even with legislative reform, uh, you know, I, I see it as a, almost an impossibility how we'd actually balance the annual you know, uh, operating losses where you weren't running a loss every year, eight to $9 billion a year is an enormous loss. And I've been of the opinion, basically, we shouldn't give you any more money unless it's attached to reform. That's the only leverage we have. When the post office becomes desperate for money, we should attach things they don't want to necessarily do. Less employees. We started that a few years ago, but we've got to do more of it. The mail keeps dropping. You've got to have less employees. That's where your legacy costs are too. Over time, you'll catch up on that, but we've got to go to less employees over time. We also need to uh, look at the easiest way to continue personalized service to each, each person individually at their house would be to do it less frequently. And frankly, uh, people who live 20 miles down a shell road, if you told them they were gonna get it twice a week versus six times a week, I think we'd actually live with this. I, I grew up in a town of 13,000 people. Uh, I still live in a small town. I really think people could could live with that, but people should be told of the uh, the problem of continuing to run massive deficits, not just in the post office, but throughout government. And that really, we shouldn't pass money out like it's candy. We should send it attached to specific reforms. Could you list some of the legal impediments you have? You're a businessman. If you came in as a venture capitalist and a venture capitalist group took over the post office and named you CEO, what would you do that you're unable to do because it's a government entity now? What are the governmental or legal restraints that prevent you from actually fixing the eight to $9 billion annual loss of the post office has? Well, thank you, uh, Senator, for the opportunity to address that. Um, I'm a little bit more optimistic than you in terms of our ability to uh, 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 meet, you know, at least get to a, a close point of a break, break, break even. Uh, number, number one, the legislative reform that I would ask is what I s said in my written testimony and opening speak, uh, uh, opening remarks on uh, uh, integration of medic of um, uh, Medicaid and uh, our reform pension pension reform. Uh, I would like to be kind of liberated on pricing uh, from the, it's a very, very competitive market uh, out there now. I would like more pricing freedom, I, I would drive, uh, uh, that would that would help us. Uh, uh, I would like some of our unfunded mandates uh, uh, addressed with. And then within the organization, I would be able without uh, as much fanfare to do a simple thing, like say adhere to our schedules. Right, and if we adhere to our schedules, uh, that will will improve performance. In transition, it, there, there there should be there, there would be an issue, uh, but uh, 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 you know, and we're seeing that recover right now. And once we get mail mail and packages moving at ninety seven percent on with trucks that are moving at ninety seven percent on time, and we're driving costs out of the system by doing that. That's what I would do in in my own business, and in my own business, I would grab new new business new business revenue. Uh, generating ideas, which we have here, that will drive billions of dollars of, 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 of contribution to the cost to serve the American people. So we we have a we 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 are in the beginning of having a plan. I'm an optimist about uh, trying to pull this off. I won't ask you your opinion on going from six days to five days because that's really the job of Congress. But uh, that's estimated to save billion billion and a half, and I think at the very least you have to do it. That could be a one sentence bill 
that saves a billion and a half dollars over there and puts us on a better footing. I think you could go further and, and instead of assessing people more of a postal charge if they live 20 miles down a dirt road, simply just have less frequent uh, delivery. And I think that alone uh, would be tolerable. They'd still have personal service, but it would be less frequent. And I think you could make up for a large amount of your shortfall uh, if you went actually below five days for some very rural areas. It's yeah. been contested or it's been said that some of your competitors, you, you use the post office for the last mile delivery and that we don't charge them an adequate amount. Um, they're sort of using the post office, the subsidized last mile delivery. Is that a problem? Do we charge your competitors enough when they get a package shipped to an area and then they use the post office for the last mile? Um, is that competitively bid? Do you think that's a problem? Should we do anything to fix that? Uh, so, so, Senator, uh, if, if I may, when I first came here, coming when I first got this assignment, that was an that was a, a, an obvious thing uh, to me. You know, cut the cut back five days, uh, or four days, whatever. And as I've worked through the process and, and researched uh, and, and studied the organization, I think the six day delivery, the connection that the uh, that the postal letter carrier has with the American. Uh, 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 people uh, that gives us this highly trusted uh, brand it, and where the where the economy is going in the future. I think that is probably our biggest strength to capitalize on. You talk about one one and a half billion dollars to take a day away. I'm sitting here on a transportation schedule change that could get us two or three billion dollars, all right, and improve service and improve the connection to the American people. So there are lots I of. I believe that when I see it, I don't doubt you, but I do doubt government and the post office history. So, uh, what about the last mile delivery by your competitors? Are we getting a market rate from them? Uh, we we are we are we are we are studying the uh, it, it. So I, I don't believe my general view. view I've been kind of been here sixty days, and I've looked at that. Uh, there there are. We make broad-based deals across the whole country that deal with average that deal with average rates. Uh, there are there are areas that we could we could push them uh, push them up, and we're studying that. Um, I, it, it is uh, uh, it, I, I don't believe it that it on the surface it's not the uh, um, uh, it's it it's reasonable business gaps uh, that may exist is, is how I describe it. All right. Well, thanks for uh, trying to fix uh, sort of a perhaps unfixable problem and hang in there and uh, just the partisan barbs. Hopefully uh, they will be portrayed for what they are, partisan barbs that uh, really aren't trying to fix anything, but they're just doing electoral politics by way of attacking you. So I apologize for that from uh, our colleagues across the aisle and wish you the best. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Paul. Senator Romney, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? Loud and clear. Go ahead. Good. Thank you. Look, I want to begin by expressing my appreciation to the thousands upon thousands of letter carriers. And I, uh, I also want to note as well that the postal workers have made our vote by mail system in Utah a reliable and uh, a very successful system, I think, for the entire nation. Um, uh, Mr. Joy, assuming as I do that you've been truthful in your testimony today, I, I can imagine how uh, frustrating it is to be accused of political motives in your management responsibility. At the same time, of course, you can uh, surely understand that there there have been pretty good reasons for people to think that that you or your colleagues are, are purposefully acting to suppress voting or uh, that you're going to purposely prevent ballots from being counted. Uh, and, and any surprise that such concerns has to be tempered by the fact that the president has made repeated claims that mail-in voting will be fraudulent and that he doesn't want to get more money to the post office because without more money, uh, you can't have universal mail in voting. Um, but uh, saying, putting that aside, let me let me note that uh, a great deal has been made of the fact that uh, you contributed to President Trump's campaign. I would note that you also generously contributed to my campaign. So some people would say that you've contributed to both sides. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me let me turn that and just yes. note. Um, <laughs> let let me note that, that that like others today, I state the obvious uh, when, when yeah. I say that reliable, uh, valid voting is essential to, to democracy here, uh, and of course to other places around the world, and, and particularly with COVID still raging, the mail is essential to uh, to our voting system and therefore to democracy. 
can can you uh, uh, do you have a high degree of confidence that that virtually all the ballots that would be mailed, let's say, seven days before an election, would actually be able to be received and counted? I mean, is if people vote within seven days of an election, are, are they are, are they highly confident? Are you highly confident that those it, ballots would then be received? Extremely highly confident. We will scour every every plant the day you know the each night leading up to election day, uh, uh, very, very confident. I very much appreciate that. That is a that is a commitment. I, I hope the American people, as they um, see news reports of, of this hearing and of others that are going to come in the House, will underscore the fact that if they get their ballots in at least seven days before an election, and, and probably even closer to the election than that, but 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 that that the person who's running the post office is saying he is highly confident those ballots will be received by the various clerks uh, in a timely way. That that is uh, that's key to us. Um, on, on a separate topic, uh, you mentioned that there are delays in the system, and that's of course to be expected. Um, are, are there are there greater delays in certain areas than others? So, for instance, are delays uh, greater in rural areas? Uh, than they are in the rest of the country. Now, Senator, I, 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 we, there's, uh, I think, more urban areas where the coronavirus, uh, 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 you know, the intimidation of uh, the coronavirus, which scares our work. Uh, our, our employee, employee availability average has dropped on a, across the nation about four, about four percent. But when you can go into some of these, what I would say, hot spots, Philadelphia, uh, Detroit, um, uh, they're as much as 20, 25, 25 percent. And we have routes. We have like Philadelphia has 750 routes. And we have days where we're short 200, 200 carriers. And this can go on for a, a, a while. So that's where uh, that's not the only contribution, but that's a bit when 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 the American people see two, three days that they haven't seen their carrier, that's, that, that's, the, uh, 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 that's an issue. And I would say there's, I, I think there's uh, 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 at least 20 of those around uh, in descending, you know, level of uh, consequence around the country. Uh, so. Yeah, thank you. I, 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 will, I will just stand by saying, uh, like a number of my colleagues who've already expressed this, uh, uh, this point, I, I would very much look forward to seeing, and, and I'm not talking about by Sunday. I just mean at some point, seeing a a plan developed by someone of your expertise in logistics uh, for how we can um, uh, get the post office to be more economically managed, but but at the same time uh, maintain a level of service which uh, which is essential for a functioning economy, and and uh, th that's a real challenge. But as someone who's done what you've done throughout your career I, I expect you to be up to up to the task and and like Senator Paul I am I am anxious for there to be a, a recognition on the part of Congress that for us to demand certain uh, service levels may require us to make legislative changes so please please feel uh, uh, welcome uh, in our committee uh, or in the house uh, for for letting us know what we need to do to make sure that you can do the job that we've asked you to do. Thank you, Mr. DeJoy. Appreciate your, your service. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Senator Romney. Uh, Senator Enzi. We really appreciate you, Chairman Johnson, for holding this hearing. Um, and I especially appreciate the Postmaster General uh, coming to this hearing, knowing what kind of uh, a target he will be. Um, it's got to be really difficult only being in office 60 days and being expected to solve all of the problems of the Postal Service. Um, it's been in a crisis for many years. Uh, Senator Collins used to head this committee when it wasn't called Homeland Security. It was government affairs and she has worked on the post office all of that time and has a pretty good bill that she's worked on with Senator Feinstein that I hope people will take a look at. Um, I'm not sure that anything can be done in a bipartisan way, particularly if one of the participants, Susan Collins, is up for election because that might help her in her campaign. But she's been dedicated to this. It isn't a new idea that she had. It's something that she's been working on 
and it has a lot of good ideas in it. I, I feel uh, I really appreciate postal workers uh, in Wyoming, particularly, uh, they're doing an outstanding job in spite of all of the difficulties of the pandemic. Uh, my father-in-law was a postal worker and uh, he was before the mail sorting machines and he was pleased that he was able to memorize all the zip codes in Sheridan, in the Sheridan area and handle the sorting. Um, of course, now local mail isn't postmarked locally. These are problems. I, I, I didn't realize that you personally deliver everything, that you personally <laughs> fix the sorting machines. Um, it was all news to me. And uh, detailed analysis, how much detailed analysis can you do in 60 days? Particularly, as I suspect, that maybe people aren't wanting to share information with you. Um, I hope that uh, those postal workers out there that are dedicated will actually do something to help out on it. And uh, of course, uh, you've been accused of picking on veterans and picking on seniors. And I have to admit that I have felt picked on, not by you, but by the Postal Service recently. Um, and I was glad to hear your explanation that you're having some difficulty with uh, people to deliver the mail in light of the pandemic. I, I don't think a lot of people understand that. I didn't understand that. But I know that we had a package that we were expecting that was being traced and we paid extra to have it traced. And we know it sat in the DC post office for 11 days before it was delivered to us. Um, there have been days that our mail wasn't picked up. So I'm, I'm glad to know that uh, the reason behind that and to find out, this is the big surprise, it wasn't you. I thought you caused all of that. Um, uh, mail sorting machines. In Wyoming, um, I don't think we sort any mail in Wyoming anymore. All those got moved to other centers. And I thought it was being done pretty efficiently in, in Wyoming. And uh, what I also learned was that when you move a sorting center under the union requirements, uh, if the people don't want to move, they don't have to move and they still get paid. That's not going to save any money. I've asked for the analysis on some of these changes that have drastically affected Wyoming, and, and which, of course, were not done under you. Uh, it was done under previous administrations. And uh, I know that they want to save money, but they've got to do some analysis that will actually save money. Uh, you used to be able to put money in a collection box, or put an envelope in a collection box for local delivery, and they got it the next day. Now, you put it in my community for local delivery. It goes to Denver first, gets sorted, and comes back to Gillette. Sometimes postmarked in Denver. That's not good management. And, uh, it, and, and as an accountant, I know that postmarks make a difference. So I'm, I'm concerned. I have a lot of concerns. And uh, I'm only pointing these out because... Um, I know that you only had 60 days to work on them and your plate was already full, but I'm trying to fill it a little bit more. And uh, I, again, appreciate that, uh, that you're, you're willing to, uh, willing to take on this, I guess you'd have to call it an adventure, not a job, because it would be too tough as a job. But I know you've made some sacrifices to, to get to this. Um, I hope that uh, you will take a look at the urban areas. We've been picked on in the rural areas for a long time, but we have some really efficient people out here that are, are dealing with long distances and, and doing it very well. Um, um, but when I go to my post office in DC, I find that there's only one person working at the counter. And if the person that comes up to the counter needs a box to mail it in, the boxes are not out where people can actually get them. So the person behind the counter has to leave and go get a box. And when they bring the box back, it still has to be sealed and addressed. And they don't move them over to the side to see if they can wait on the next customer. Everybody waits at social distancing. Um, I've been to the post office before during my lunch hour and uh, found that the postal workers decided that was their lunch hour as well. No business lets their employees sit down and eat in front of customers um, during during their lunch hour. Um, well, enough of my 
yeah. I guess trying to do, trying to defend you here, but uh, Sen you Senator, you thank you. If I, Senator, if I may, uh, you know, the and thank you for uh, uh, that the, the the support. But if I may, the day I take the seat, as with any organization, the day you become the CEO, uh, you're responsible for everything that that goes on uh, uh, around you. And I have big enough shoulders to uh, uh, to deal with that. But what uh, but more important about what you said in the beginning about legislation, um, uh, uh, you know, not not moving. Uh, we, the organization, needs to, and this board, we will move forward. We have to, because without legislation, without any assistance, we will run out of money. And uh, nine months, twelve. We talk. We talk about a six hundred thirty-three thousand person organization, and nine months worth of cash, and everybody thinks we're okay. That's outrageous thinking. And uh, so we need to, uh, uh, we will, uh, 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 and that's kind of the difference now. When we're, we are moved, as I said in my opening remarks, the Board of Governors, we will do what we need to do to stay, uh, 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 you know, to meet our operating objectives and we stay, get to self-sustaining, uh, 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 you know, manner. So thank you. I, I appreciate your willingness to be here. And uh, I hope that you will take a look at the uh, Collins Feinstein bill and uh, give us some analysis on that. And uh, I recognize that you have to rely on the postmasters across the United States of doing their job to manage their own business. So thank hey, you, thank you for great. taking this They'd job. Thanks, thank you, Senator Enzi. Uh, Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. DeJoy, for being here. Let, let me see if I can ask a few questions to get started that will maybe help clear out some of this uh, misinformation that we have heard repeated over and over and over again in the media, and uh, some of it echoed uh, today. Uh, just to be clear, will USPS have enough cash on hand to support operating expenses through the November election? Yes, sir. Has the Postal Service seen an increase, actually, in total operating revenues in the most recently reported quarter relative to last year? Yes, sir. Small, but yes. Has the Postal Service seen its overall cash on hand position increase since the start of the pandemic in March to a level of approximately 15 billion? Is that right? Uh, somewhere between 14 and 15 billion. Yes. So if I've understood your testimony correctly today, what I've heard you say and also what I've read in your written testimony, your, your testimony to us is that the Postal Service has the wherewithal, it has the resources, it has what it needs in order to deliver the mail safely and on time through the November election, just to be clear about that. Is that right? So yes, yes, Senator, there's two separate things now. They deliver on the election and cash to operate the business in the future are two separate things. But yes, we have plenty of cash to operate for the election. Yeah, now just yeah. on that second point, since you bring it up, what's your estimate of, of the amount of additional assistance that you require as you look toward the future, past November and into the months and years to come? I think we have had, so A, the biggest thing we need is legislative reform and uh, free, you know, the PRC to decide. But I estimated about $10 billion. We estimate about $10 billion cost on the COVID expense side. Um, and uh, what I would like to see is the note that we have uh, negotiated with Treasury be uh, used to have get long-term financing to buy new vehicles. Can I just ask you about that since you bring up the note from Treasury? So the CARES Act uh, authorized $10 billion in, in borrowing authority. I understand that, that uh, you reached USPS and the Treasury Department came to an agreement uh, late last month in principle over what uh, that would be, uh, what that would look like. Can you give us a sense of, of when this $10 billion that was authorized, it's a loan, when this is likely uh, to be made available to you, uh, what you see its utility as? Just, just give us an update on where that stands. So we have uh, we have a, a, a terms of agreement, and all we would need to do is when we request it, uh, uh, get a final document on it. But the terms have uh, been agreed. I mean, the issue here with borrowing money uh, is you need to know how you're going to pay it back. And um, you know, at, at this particular point, you know, we uh, we we're evaluating uh, uh, that, but it is available uh, uh, to us pretty quickly. 
and and what do you anticipate using it for in, in the near term, assuming that you do avail it, yourselves of it? There's, there's pretty specific uh, 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 limitation. I cannot use it for capital, but I can use it to cover operating costs that are closely associated with COVID, and we can identify that pretty easily. Now, you said just a second ago, uh, when we first when you first introduced the topic of the loan, you said that you would you would like additional authority to, to perhaps use the loan uh, toward vehicles or as collateral for vehicles. Can you say more about that? Yeah, so we have, uh, you probably know, we have many 30-year-old vehicles and that we're desperately in need of new vehicles. Um, the loan is not for, for capital. I would like to see the term extended and used as a capital type uh, uh, equipment loan uh, to buy vehicles and other types of uh, uh, modernization efforts that we have. But longer term than five years. Very good. And so what you would, that is part of the sort of the legislative, additional legislative reforms or authorizations you seek. Am I understanding you correctly? Yes, sir. And Got it. Go ahead. They've already been passed in a, 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 in a committee a couple of years ago, what we're looking for. Right. Understood. Um, let's come back to um, uh, some of the reforms that you uh, had recently implemented. Uh, to what degree were any of the changes that you implemented over the summer a response to the OIG's recent findings? Um, I considered the OIG's recent findings uh, uh, um, as we were doing our own at my, my own our own analytics i thought they were for a new somebody new coming in i thought they were a remarkable gift uh in terms of just laying out uh two things with that the system was out of balance the system the transportation system forty thousand trucks a day were running once you get below uh you know below 90 percent you, you can't depend on anything Right. Uh, uh, and uh, so uh, that was uh, and then it was a cost gift. So both things when I came in here looking at where the where the organization was headed financially uh, and what was the what was the thing I could balance or we could balance around that transport, getting that transportation network aligned, uh, uh, which we will do and uh, uh, and saving, a, you know, a, a, a billion, billion and a half to two billion dollars, which we, we, we can reach for. Uh, was uh, a, a Christmas present. I was elated. Very good. Um, let me just ask you here. I see my time has almost expired, but let me just ask you in conclusion. I mean, uh, as you probably know, my home state of Missouri, we have a very significant percentage of our population in rural areas. It's the part of the state that I'm from where I grew up. Uh, it's, it is absolutely vital to me that any Postal Service reform going forward continue to preserve the network of rural delivery uh, uh, service, that it, it preserves the existing uh, uh, delivery uh, and, and post office box uh, services that are available throughout rural Missouri. So can I just ask you, are you committed to protecting rural delivery and rural post offices uh, in, for people like uh, the, the folks I represent in Missouri and around the country? So we have an unbelievable asset in our letter carriers reaching every American uh, 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 each day. Uh, and I commit to try and, trying to strengthen that relationship across the country. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. DeJoy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Hawley. Before I go to Senator Cinema, based on uh, uh, one of the questions and your response from uh, Senator Hawley, you, you talked about the trans transportation system just being out of sync. In your written testimony, I just want to make sure that we're talking about the same thing here. Uh, you said your on-time trips went from 35,000 per day to 39,000 per day, uh, which means uh, on you know schedule time of 89% uh, improved to 97%. So is that what you're talking about? Your, your trucks actually leaving on time to get yeah. in their routes and is that has that been part of the disruption as well as if, if the letters aren't getting to those trucks in time, they may be left behind for next day's delivery. Can, can you just expand yeah. you know, just explain well, that, clarify that a little better? Yes. Yeah, so there inside the plants, there's a production schedule for mail that would meet that that's set up to meet a dispatch schedule for trucks that gets tied to a destination center for let's just say, keep it simple, go right to the 
delivery units where carriers go out in the morning and carriers then could come back at, at, at night. Oh, this whole thing is an aligned schedule in theory on, on, on paper. And we, there's lots of imbalances uh, that, we've, that, we, that we're finding as we, went, as we went through this process. But the big thing to try and get everything aligned around is that transportation schedule. And now we have taken that up and all that mail that was going late, all that was, was on that truck was also late mail. Right now we have advanced the mail. We just, some of the mail that coming off the processing lines, uh, we, 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 we did a, uh, we found these imbalances and we did a not as great a job as we should in recovering for it, but we will, I'm seeing improvements right now. Once that comes together, mail will be moving around the country at 90, 97% on, you know, on, on, on time. And I'm very, very excited and committed to trying to do that. And that again, enables us to balance the front end and the back and the delivery end of, of, of the system and saves us all that money that you saw in the, uh, uh, in, in the audit report. And it's, uh, it's in, in billions, not in millions. So, so as a former manufacturer, I realize if you don't have a good process, process, you don't have a good product. So you came in and you identified some real process breakdowns. In a very short period of time, you made a pretty dramatic improvement in terms of the on-time dispatch level, in terms of that transportation system. Now, you obviously have COVID, which is affecting our entire economy, and obviously it affects the postal system as well. So, you know, basically what I'm hearing out of your testimony is the delivery delays are primarily being caused by the issues related to COVID, but the changes you made in terms of the process, uh, certainly in theory, if, if it hadn't already improved it already, is certainly gonna set you up for, for improvement and cost reductions and cost savings in the future. Yeah, it, 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 so I will, I, I, a, a substantial portion of our delays are re related to COVID. I, will, I won't go as far as to not say that uh, uh, we, we had maybe a four or five percent hit on our on our uh, a service level for delayed all sorts of mail, marketing mail, everything because it got stuck uh, on on a dock, and we're we're drastically bringing that down. And uh, 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 once that is aligned, we should have a smooth uh, you know running si system at, at a you know much more high performance uh, you know, rate. Okay, so some yeah. stuff is through the change, but again, those changes yeah. are necessary yeah. to try. Yeah. Cost savings and improvement in the future. This this is very doable. So FedEx and UPS do it. Okay, great. Uh, Sandra Cinnamon. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for holding this important hearing. And I want to thank Postmaster General DeJoy for joining us today. The U.S. Postal Service has always been a critical lifeline for communities across Arizona and the entire nation. And during this pandemic, it's even more true. Over the past week, my office has heard from over 18,000 Arizonans about the importance of the Postal Service. Arizonans want to ensure the Postal Service will continue to deliver prescription drugs, assist small businesses, and support their right to vote. Arizona has led the way on safe and secure mail-in voting for years. The Postal Service must act to support our upcoming election, especially since we will see increases in vote by mail due to the pandemic. But our hearing today shouldn't just be about election mail. My constituents have also shared stories about prescriptions that took so long to arrive, they worry whether the medication is spoiled. Others are concerned their small business will go under without reliable poster service or that rent checks and bill payments now take a week longer to reach their destination than just a few months ago. So Mr. DeJoy, I'm pleased that you heed a request from me and my colleagues to answer questions about the operational services the Postal Service was making. It's critical that you and your team demonstrate a commitment to protecting the ability of customers to get the service they rely on every day. And successfully communicating with Congress, stakeholders, and election officials is a big part of that effort. So for my first question, in Arizona, we expect 85 to 90% of the electorate to vote by mail this general election. That's approximately 2.4 million ballots moving through the postal network in Arizona in the weeks before the election. Given that significant volume, unexpected challenges will certainly arise and adjustments will need to be made. I've been working closely with the Arizona Secretary of State's office to ensure that they and other local election officials get their questions answered regarding mail issues so that we can have fair elections. And I'm gonna to continue to share the full range of questions that my office receives with you and your team. And of course, their top concern is the timely delivery of ballots. So will local postal managers be authorized to make decisions and have postal employees make extra trips or late trips, work overtime in order to deliver ballots 
to ensure that plants and post offices don't fall behind in processing election mail. Yes, ma'am. Effective October 1st, we will have redundant resources and liberal liberalization and, and uh, uh, aggressive efforts to make sure everything is moving and flowing timely. I appreciate that. Could you tell me what steps your office is taking to communicate this policy to postal managers, election officials, stakeholders, and to the public in Arizona so everyone feels confident that citizens have fair access to voting by mail? Yes, ma'am. In, in, in general, we, we I think we started back in February. We've reached out. We've had over 50,000 50, uh, contacts with the uh, election officials around the, the, the country. As you know, we've sent a number of letters. We, uh, uh, we, we, we uh, are making uh, videos that will go online uh, with the uh, union leadership and, and myself to uh, 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 to communicate out uh, our commitment, uh, uh, you know, to this, and we continue to work with the uh, state the state boards and our board. Uh, uh, we decided to put together a, a, a bipartisan committee on the board to uh, 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 kind of oversee over uh, you know everything that we're going to be doing. Uh, so we are uh, we are emphasizing. Uh, uh, um, in, in fact, in a, I think in September we're going to send a letter to every American. Uh, with uh, what what our process is uh, 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 go, going out every to every American citizen, so uh, I think we uh, uh, I, I feel good. I appreciate the question, and I feel good about uh, uh, what uh, the whole organization, from the board of directors down to uh, our, uh, our, our letter carriers and uh, uh, plant personnel. Uh, 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 we're very very proud of what we're doing, and we're going to deliver for the American people. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, postal processing plants are the critical piece to ensure that everyday mail arrives in a timely fashion and that all the votes are counted. And so we want to make sure those processing plant operations remain smooth and efficient. Earlier this week in your announcement, you said you would not close any postal processing facilities before the election. But I don't think you specifically ruled out consolidations of processing plants. So my question is, is the Postal Service planning to modify or reduce capacity at any postal processing facilities before the election? And if so, what specific steps are you taking to ensure that the Postal Service can continue to meet service standards for both election and regular mail in the communities served by those facilities? Senator, I promise you, we are not making any changes until after the election. I appreciate that. That was a very concise and direct answer. <laughs> I love it. Um, as you know, I recently wrote to you regarding the Cherry Bell processing plant in Tucson. It's very important to mail service in that community and throughout Arizona. If the Postal Service considers consolidations or closures of processing facilities in the future, would you require new area mail processing studies for any impacted facility or other similar analysis before moving forward with a consolidation or a closure? Uh, thank, thank you, Senator. There is a, and I'm not totally familiar with it, but there is a whole process that, a, a pretty uh, detailed process that we need to go through uh, to before we close a, a, a facility. And I, I'd be, if that, we'll, we'll take that down. If that facility ever gets on that, I'll make sure we reach out to you in advance and uh, I'll let you know. But there is a, a whole public awareness process, a detailed analysis of as to how the mail is going to be processed, it's uh, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, so, uh, uh, but we we have it marked down, and we'll keep you posted if that ever gets on our list of, it, of well, uh, interested locations. I appreciate that. Just for your awareness, the original AMP for Cherry Bell was done in 2011, and as you're probably aware, we've had very significant population growth throughout Arizona since then. So we want to make sure that decisions are made with up-to-date data. And so I'll follow up with you soon about this topic because mm -hmm. this is very important for Arizona um, and it's very important for our Southern Arizona in particular. Um, look Mr. To... Chairman, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Troy. You just said, look forward to speaking to you about it. Thank you. I know my time is almost done. I, the last thing I'll just say is when you next consider operational changes, um, I'd ask you to take into account the negative customer experiences that folks have shared with us like spoiled medicine or missing rent checks. We've been getting more complaints about service getting worse in, since some of these most recent changes. We um, ask that you would take into account these negative customer experiences when making decisions in the future. And my team is happy to share some of those direct experiences with you. 
Thank you uh, uh, for, for your guidance, ma'am. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for being with us today. And Mr. Chairman, thank you for this opportunity and I yield back. Well, thank you, uh, Senator Sinema. Well, but let me just, uh, again, thank you, Mr. Poster, Postmaster General for appearing here on pretty short notice uh, and subjecting yourself to this uh, hearing process. Uh, just to quick summarize a few things we heard today. You know, obviously uh, the postal system is, uh, every bit is affected by COVID as the rest of this nation has been economically devastating. So I think for, for anybody to assume that uh, you know service would maintain its high level standards when we're in the midst of a pandemic, I think is quite unrealistic. Uh, as you've stated, uh, I think the, the operational changes that uh, you implemented uh, are designed for long-term improvement, but uh, they created some disruptions as well. Um, so, but again, coming from a manufacturing background, I realize you have to have a good process. Things have to run on time. And you recognize that as well. So I'm again, I'm, I'm highly supportive of those efforts. I think that should be commended, not condemned. Uh, as I stated, there's no doubt there have been some unusual delays, COVID, uh, some operational changes. But as I check with our constituent service folks, uh, what they are also finding is, is the high volume of calls uh, concerning post complaints. Uh, the vast majority seem very highly scripted. Like this could be a very well organized effort, which which doesn't surprise me the slightest. Uh, there are fundraising uh, emails from Senate candidates and Senate uh, Senate and the Democrat senatorial uh, committee dating back as far as April, uh, complaining about this postal postal issue. So I have no doubt the Democrats are ginning this uh, these issues and these problems up into something that it's not a, a, a very false narrative, as I said, designed to. Uh, extract a, a political uh, advantage. And you know, Mr. Post Master General, I, I'm just very sorry that you are on the, the targeting end of this political hit piece. I think, it's, I think it's very unfortunate, it's very tragic. This is, as somebody else pointed out, this is part of the problem why we have not had post reform is how, how people take advantage of it. And uh, again, the, the expectations I appreciated Senator Enzi's uh, very common sense uh, a statement of, of a number of different facts. Uh, you've only been on the job 60 days. You've got a great background. I truly appreciate your willingness to serve this role. As you heard from the committee, we truly appreciate the, the, the hard work of the men and women of the U.S. Postal Service uh, doing a good job delivering our mail. Uh, but we need reforms moving forward. So we might have an opportunity here. Uh, there, there may be another COVID relief package. Uh, it probably will include something for postal. So if there's going to be dollars allocated, what I'm certainly asking uh, you for is the information, the data, and the suggestions for, for true reforms. I think that's what's always been lacking as I've been in this position in terms of post reform. It's always a taxpayer bailout, bailout absent of the types of reforms that we need to also make legislatively. So I really look for your guidance. I look for your data. It's another real shortcoming from uh, my dealing with the U.S. Postal Service here. Uh, we just don't get the data that I think we really need to enact effective legislation. I'd like to actually enact effective legislation that's gonna require uh, cooperation with, with you and, and the postal workers. So again, you know, th thank you for your service. Thank you for stepping in this role. I apologize for uh, the, 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 the fact that you've become a target in a political hit job. Uh, it's very unfortunate. Uh, but with that- Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, certainly. Would you yield to me for, for a minute or two, please? Absolutely. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks so much. The, uh, I, as you may recall, uh, Mr. Chairman, one of our colleagues, late Tom uh, Cobra, and I worked for years on uh, major changes in the Postal Service, real reforms. And we've done that. We've developed bipartisan uh, consensus around that. And uh, we can do that again. Uh, among the things that, that we've heard here today, there's an interest in uh, Medicare integration. I think we ought to look at that. Uh, there's an acknowledgement that uh, there need to be uh, major investments in the fleet, the postal fleet. Uh, the average age of the fleet of, uh, of, of postal vehicles, 27 years old. There are investments that need to be made for uh, additional modern package processing equipment in our distribution centers across the country. And there's, I think there's a, the, the ability to come up with, uh, with uh, a bipartisan consensus on how to help the postal service, not just get through a pandemic, but be relevant and efficient and vibrant in the years to come. The, uh, the, the secret to vibrant democracy, the two C's, communicate and compromise. And uh, our, our, with all due respect to our uh, Postmaster General, 
I'm I'm pretty good at bipartisan top part. I reached out to you when you were just uh, initially selected by the uh, the uh, uh, the postal board of governors, and then later on I tried to reach you again and again for weeks and couldn't even get a, a call back. And I wasn't the only one. You got to be willing to communicate. You got to be willing to communicate. And there's some people in the administration who who do a great job at that. Bob Lighthizer, a trade representative, is one. Uh, Mnuchin, Secretary of, of uh, Treasury, is one. And I would urge you to to emulate uh, them. Uh, this is a shared responsibility. It's not on the post office. It's not on the men and women who work at the post office. It's not on the board of governors or on you as a postmaster. It's on us as well. This is a shared responsibility. Our country is counting on, counting on us. I'm, and we're counting on a democracy. Last thing I'll mention, I'll go back to Ben Franklin, first postmaster general. Remember what he said coming out of that building at the end of the Constitutional Convention when they said, what have you done here? What have you created? And he said, a republic if we can keep it. A republic if we can keep it. And one of the keys to keeping it is, frankly, a vibrant postal service and the ability for people to vote, Democrat, Republican, or whatever, for people to cast their votes and know they're going to be counted. That's critical. We've got a president, sadly, who wants to undermine Say a little bit. all this fund, the <laughs> postal service, and the undermine the ability to be voted by mail. That's just unacceptable. Hopefully, we can do better than that. And I'm, I commit my, uh, for myself, some of my colleagues to try to do just that. Do better. We can always do that. In order to form a more perfect union, we can do better. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, if I could uh, say a few comments to you just briefly. Senator Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Postmaster uh, DeJoy, I just I want to take an opportunity to thank you uh, as well for appearing us uh, appearing before us so willingly and certainly on uh, very short notice. But I also want to be very clear about what I've been hearing, and I think you've heard from my members, and just uh, to counter a little bit of what the chairman said. These are real concerns that I'm hearing. Uh, these are not manufactured. These are people who are coming forward, talking about delays, talking about medicine that's not available for them, talking about how we, I have this, I sure shared the story with a, an individual who, who did because of uh, the lack of medicine, uh, skipped uh, doses and was actually uh, hospitalized. Those, those are very real. And when I hear those kinds of stories, we stand up, that's my job. It's the job of every senator here to stand up and for our constituents, for the people back home who are being hurt and make sure that their voice is heard. That's what this is about. It's about making sure people's voices are heard. And that is what this hearing's about. This is why we're standing up and making sure the Postal Service does what they have done with incredible integrity and professionalism for 245 years. We wanna make sure that that standard continues going forward. I fully appreciate that the COVID has created significant problems uh, for the Postal Service, but I won't show my chart again, but if you look at the chart, the service was there through the through uh, a lot of uh, the pandemic. It's just been in the middle of July where you see it dropping off dramatically. The COVID's been with us since March, but we've seen a dramatic drop since mid-July, which is the time when I got uh, all of those communications and my colleagues have been getting those com uh, those communications. They're not manufactured. These are real people. So, real certainly people. Are. so I, I just want to be clear about that. So uh, Mr. Uh, or Post Minister Joy, you, you answered um, uh, some of our questions today and I thank you for that. But, but there's still many, many left that are unanswered. And I think we all look forward to uh, seeing the documents that we have requested so we can do our oversight function delivered to us in a timely fashion. I appreciate your willingness to do that. I'm going to continue my investigation of uh, the recent uh, delays and postal service practices that have been put in place. And I, and I urge you and your staff uh, to be fully forthcoming with any additional requests. That kind of transparency is critically important in this job. I know you have a very hard job. And frankly, I think you've made it harder on yourself because of the lack of transparency that we have seen here these last few weeks. So in the coming weeks, Congress uh, certainly must provide Postal Service uh, with the resources and the oversight that you need to reliably deliver mail for the American people, uh, but not just through this election. Uh, we have to make sure we get through the election, we've got to get through the pandemic, and we want to make sure we put the Postal Service on sound financial footing to last for another 245 years and beyond. So thank you again. Thank you, sir. Okay, thanks, Senator Peters. And again, I, I am in no way, shape, or form denying that uh, many of these complaints are absolutely genuine and, and we take these seriously and help our constituents. But there's also no doubt that uh, a lot of this is, is being ginned up. Uh, many of those complaints are highly scripted and uh, it's being done for political purpose. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt about that. But we have a new postmaster general who's been in, in the office less than 70 days. You know, from my standpoint, I think the first thing he, he needs to do is get up 
uh, get, you know, start the job, roll up his shirts, her, his uh, shirt sleeves, and and get to work and try and figure out uh, what he needs to do to reform the process. So, uh, I, I'm looking forward to a totally transparent process here. I'm looking to separate the fact from the fiction. And my problem is there's a lot of fiction, uh, a lot of false narrative being ginned up by by Democrats to the left right now. So I, I want the data as well. Uh, Mr. Postmaster General, I'm sure you will, you will work with us in the future. And that's what I'm basically giving you the opportunity to do. I th there's a possibility for a, a post reform bill, even in uh, this next COVID relief package, if, if there is one. So uh, let's work in good faith. Uh, thank you again for your service. Thank the men and women of the US, United States Postal Service for their uh, service as well. Uh, the hearing record will remain open for 15 days until September 3rd at 5 p.m. for the submission of statements and questions for the record. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you.